Hello, everyone. Welcome. Long time no see. I've been very busy putting together some really cool things with subtext and muse. And specifically, I wanted to record this video to give everybody an idea of the future, which is to be less structured and still being able to take advantage of all the things that you can get in a story form, but to be able to flow with it much, much better. So there's a little bit of an update here that we can go through. Let's go to the story central. All right. So this will look like the way that you've always seen it. But if I go into my stories and we pop this guy open, now you might see something a little bit different, which is you get your usual list of stories, but they have this nice little icon here to let you know it's there. But then within the stories, you'll see all the story forms that are attached to that story. So for those of you who don't know, a story can have several different story forms. So something like Lord of the Rings has several different story forms. The Empire Strikes Back has two story forms. Generally speaking, you just have the one. And so what's nice is subtext allows you just to work on the one. So the one I'm going to go over today is this Santa Claus and Sedona thing. But you can just work with the story without having a story form. If you know exactly what you're doing and you're an expert, and you've built it, you can still just use Muse. And I'll go through what that looks like as well. But you'll see everything here listed. This is just a test thing, but you can see here all these different story forms that are there. And that's one of the great things about the new version is when I started building subtext seven years ago, obviously there was no AI. So my company narrative first, the idea, which was born out of all my work in the animation industry was you had to have the story form first before you could wait until the last two months to figure out what your story is about. And so it was necessary because all the different elements within a story form are all related to one another, then you have to make sure you figure out what your story is about ahead of time. The nice thing about all the AI stuff and all this stuff is, especially now with this new Muse integration, is that you can easily work on a story form for about half your story or your development and then decide, oh, wait, shoot, I think I want to change the story form. And before you had to do a lot of manual work, now you can just have Muse do it. And you can try out different ones too. If you're not sure what you want your ending to be like, you can play around with them and mix and match them and see what will come out of it. So let's look at this one. So this is just my little test one that I had come up with. So when you go into your story here, I already have a bunch of stuff here, but let's just say you're in Muse. I'll show you what it looked like when I first started out, but you have the story explorer or whatever muse flow. I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to call it yet, but the idea is that you can access all the different parts of your story here in muse. You don't have to go into the old story development page. It's still there for you, but you can also just hang out here and just do everything in muse, which I personally, I think it's a dream come true and it's exactly what I would do for whatever it is we're doing in the future. And it, it, there are different sections here. A lot of them will seem familiar to those who have used subtext before. Obviously, your story forms, that would take you to the story forms. The overviews would be sub, like when you are just doing your different through lines, but you're not sure that what domain it's in, what problem. It's always a good idea to have a storytelling understanding of what your through lines are, all your arcs. Anything that's just storytelling, it's not necessarily tied to a specific aspect of the story form would be overview. It's also where you would put genre, no more drop down stuff, just write the genre out. Players would be all your objective story players. And then story points and story beats. Story points would be all the spatial things, the relationship between thematic items in your story. And they show up in every act. And then story beats are essentially your acts from one act to the next. And then all the conversations that are in the context of the story. So what you'll find out is I redesigned a little bit of the interface here for Muse just to make it a little easier. The one thing you'll notice is up here at the top is just your typical back home button. So if you're in the story, it'll take you back to the Muse dashboard, like the front screen. If you're in that screen, then it'll take you back to Story Central. Up here is just your basic context menu. So you can see all the conversations, the ones that you favored it. And then this takes you back to that story page that I was showing you before. A new one and that will create a new conversation with Muse. You might want to, it's really good at 
just doing a long stream of consciousness and just dump everything in there. In the past, after about 20 or 30, you probably should start a new one. Now, especially if you're on the advanced model, feel like you can go crazy and just dump in as much as you, you possibly want to. And the new will change. If you're not in a story, it'll just be blank without any context. Down here in the bottom left, you'll see the current context that we're in. So we're in the context of this story. So all the conversations are going to be essentially saved into this project. They're going to refer to this. It will have access to everything that you have in here. This is when you have the context. It's also a button you can see, so it'll take you back to this spot right here. And then for the other stuff, so if you're missing what happened to the personas, it's just this context menu here where you can upload, and that works really great now if you've tried it before and you're wondering where it is, upload anything, your latest scene, your latest draft, throw in a bunch of character descriptions, whatever you want, it's really fun. <laughs> and then the muse mode is the mode that we're set into right now. So if I open this up, the top two are the fine tuned ones, and there will likely be more in the future that I've worked really hard on to make awesome. So muse is your default one. That's usually where you want to keep it. If you're somebody that wants to learn a lot about narrative theory and isn't so much interested in working on a story as far as like just improving your education. This one is great because it accesses the last couple decades. Muse does too as well, but this is really focused heavily on it. So it's a really good one to pay attention to or to select if you want to focus on it. And then the bottom set of different buttons here are the different personas. So I have a personal persona, I don't know, personal persona, but a global persona that everybody has for Muse. If you want, everybody can change the core persona, which is essentially just doing custom instructions if you worked with any kind of other AI. So you can gear it towards your own specialty, what you want. Everybody has access to that. And then if you are on the higher tiers like Pro or Infinite, then you can add as many extra personas as you want with this one being more it's just an alternative way of doing a core persona. And then these are storytelling personas. So what they do is they strip out all the stuff in between, all the narrative structure, all the theory, everything, and are just like a really just bare bones. You determine the AI that you want. So in other words, if you have a bunch of subscriptions to other AI services and you just want one, you could conceivably just do this one and then just create the different personas and they won't have all the context of Muse. I use it for doing the actual like writing. So once you get all the structure done, Frederick here is an expert. He's an expert at writing screenplays. He's an expert at writing them in the fountain format. That's about all he does. That's really good. So it's just a nice first draft that I use to just write it out real quick. All right. So that does it for all those things. And then, yeah, you can go ahead and just develop your stories. So I have a ton of conversations here. These are all a result of just testing that I was doing. And I'll just do the first one because this is where I started out just building this. And I just came in here and without any context, please come up with a fun little children's book about Santa Claus having an existential crisis and moving to that place in Arizona that everyone goes to, which is Sedona, and living his life out in a van that he made for himself. Just write up the overall synopsis and then visualize it for me as an independent movie out of the 90s. Alrighty, I'm back. My usual recording application keeps crashing. So typically I would start over from fresh, but I just want to move on with my life. So hopefully they'll get it fixed. I'm not the only one who occasionally has issues with the applications that they create. All right. So what I was working on here was, please come up with a fun little children's book about Santa Claus having an existential crisis and moving to that place in Arizona everyone goes to and living out his life in a van that he made for himself. Just write up the overall synopsis. So what I was saying was just write up the overall synopsis and then visualize it for me as if an independent movie out of the mid nineties. So if you are on the pro tier or the infinite tier, you can do image generation. It's reasonable. It's okay. It's just a fun way to give you some ideas and maybe spur some more imaginative, creative things. It's not meant to be the end product. At least it's, who knows, maybe eventually someday it'll be good enough right now to me. It's okay. Here's the visual representation of what it could look like as a mid-90s movie poster. 
which is all right. If you're interested, we can continue to develop the story further or explore the unique narrative structure using the story forming process. So you can think of this like your story idea is just, okay, this is what I want to work on. And this is the exciting part to me because in the past, when I've had to sh try and show subtext or even explain it to anybody, I had to go through hours of teaching narrative theory. And that's a lot. That's a lot. It's a big ask. And most people give up and throw their hands in the air. This is like taking that big mess of ideas that you have and then slowly bringing some form to it. So your story forming, as opposed to the past where you had to story form, which meant required you had to have all this knowledge and then you could start. Now you can just play with this stuff and kind of get an idea of what that form would look like. Cause there's tens of thousands of different narrative structures. It's not just one. So that's what it's saying there. And then of course you can download it, all that fun stuff. So then that gave me the idea. What was that movie about van life? And I was thinking of um, Francis McDormand, right? Francis? Nomadland. So for fun, can you just use that story form and let me know what Santa's main character through line would be all about? And I, this was an idea that just popped into my head as if it was Santa was the main character in that film, which was a very dramatic, very serious, beautiful film. I'm going to make it a little bit happier at the end. I don't want it to be as bleak or as, as happy as it could have been just because it's Santa Claus. But I like the idea of maybe taking that same thing, that same narrative, and then forming it to what I want. So I'm taking that same narrative structure, which has a whole bunch of different thematic things going on, and then I'm going to mix and match it together and tweak some things to make it my own. So what's great is there's hundreds of different narrative structures that I've personally gone through and that as a group, a community group, we've gone over for at least three decades where we've worked out all the different narrative dynamics for all these different story forms. No Man Land is one of them. And what it does is it puts the domain, at least in that narrative, and I'll try and avoid the narrative theory here. This is great. I don't know. Maybe you don't know what the domain of physics is. So it will explain to you, well, in that kind of story, Santa's process of finding himself would involve this very down-to-earth, hands-on exploration of life in a van emphasizing activities like stargazing, yoga, and storytelling around campfires. So you can start to get an idea of what the narrative would be like, and that matches what Francis's character was doing in Nomadland. His problem would be thought, which I work out a little bit better later on, but the idea is that what's driving him in this story is either overthinking his past and his purpose, Cycling through deep contemplations about his traditions versus new desires, that kind of thing. And then his resolve would be steadfast, which is how she is in the film, where he would maintain his inner core values and remain true to himself. His physical journey reflects a resolve to find a new way. And then a little more specific here with another dynamic, which I'll just skip for now. So that's taking the narrative of No Man Land and just giving it a little bit of form. Okay, it's going to be struggling with thoughts. He's going to be doing a lot of hands-on sort of things. And I just wanted to make sure, because that was like an easy answer, that we illustrate thought as a true source of conflict and then go ahead and save the above into my story. So this is the coolest thing where you can just do all your work here, save it into your story, save it into your story form. Make sure you be very specific about which one because they are different. And then Muse will take care of it. All right. So forgive me again, it crashed again as I was recording. I think I got this fixed. All right, so where was I? Those actually sound pretty good. Can we make sure that is illustrated as a source of conflict? And then go ahead and save the above into my story. So it says, we see, it seems we need to create a new story form for the van life of Santa Claus in Sedona. Would you like me to set that up for you? Super nice. So it's just like you're talking to your assistant and they'll go ahead and take care of everything. So what it did is, I guess it asked if I want to make the story form. So I said, can we hold off on that and just save them into the story for now? So even before I get to story form, I can save stuff like the main character problem, their resolve, any sort of information. I can save that to the story and just hold off on actually getting to a story form. It's like a catch-all for all my ideas. I've successfully saved Santa's main character problem of thought into your story. So what it did is it made the story and then this popped up down here in the bottom left to let me know that's the rest. This whole conversation is in the context of this story now. 
Additionally, I've stored the main character through line, focusing on Santa's adventures and dilemmas within the realm of physics. All right, is there anything else you want to do? What that does is, and then if I go back to the story here, and I go to the, let's look at the story points. So you'll see there are a bunch here that I've worked on as I've been testing it. And one of those is the problem, which would be that one of thought. So it comes up here, and then I know I'm looking at this story, and I'm looking at story points, and here are the details of the main character problem. And it goes about and discusses everything that I've developed so far to work on his problem, which is that you can think of it like their blind spot, what's driving them in the story. And you'll notice it's a little different. Santa Claus is enveloped in a perpetual concern about what others think of him, a consideration for everyone that turns his once virtuous thoughtfulness into a confining trap. So he's going on this existential journey, wants to get away from everything, but he's just so thoughtful and he just cares about what everybody thinks and is always very thoughtful about other people that he just can't stop being himself, that kind of stuff. And the way that came about was actually, I think you'll see there have been two different conversations. The first one is the one that I just showed you. And then this was something I was working on later which we can drop into and I can show you what that looks like, where I went and I worked on his focus and direction. So if his blind spot is that thoughtfulness and he doesn't know that's what's driving him, what other people think about him, then the focus is where he thinks the problem is. It's where he's like, his attention is, oh, that's my problem, which is something to do with ability. And then the direction in order to address that is desire. So you can see that as a main character is just caught in the cycle of working through these two things until eventually at the end of the story, if they do change, Fern, which I guess is the Francis McDormand's character's name, continues to do this. So that happens. There's some stories where they don't actually completely change, but they keep doing the things that they've always done. So it gave me a general idea, which was more of a description of what these two are about, what I just did. So yeah, you can think of this as like, you're just working through the story with me but you can do it on your own schedule. You can do it in any language that you want. There's some people who do it in French, some people do it in Spanish, some in Mandarin. You can do it any language you want and get all my narrative expertise helped out here so you can work out a really cool story. So then if I, okay, so then what I did, oh, so then this was my idea and there's something I want to say about this. Okay, okay, so this is what I put. Oh, let's get, get a bit of that wanderlust. So the ability is feeling like you want to make sure you always have the ability to leave and do whatever you want, which would make sense for Santa after spending a century always making gifts and delivering them. And then the direction there is that feeling that your desires will be fulfilled just around the corner and they're not. So the original way I got this in here is I didn't type it out. I just flipped on the microphone and just talked and just spoke into it. And the really great thing about that is there's lots of fumbling around here. I can just do this again, stream of consciousness, all my different ideas. And then use is really good at looking at the meaning of what it is that you're trying to say, even if you made a mistake here and there, but that's a really good opportunity to just get what's in your head out into a manageable form that you can then create this story because you're just speaking your story into existence. And when you speak, but then type it out, then you get restricted a little bit by the typing. So you just want to, to me, it's the best thing, especially if I'm on my phone, mess around with it. That to me is the best. And eventually once the voice mode or whatever is set up so that I can just incorporate that in Amuse, then you can just interrupt, have a great time, laugh, create all kinds of stories. It'll be really fun. But for right now, you just have to do the back and forth. I speak, then you speak. So when I sent that off, I love the Wanderlust twist for Santa. So then the idea being that he's not able to do all this stuff. He's not free to roam and do all this other stuff. But the focus on the bill is all about maintaining the freedom to roam and do as he pleases after centuries of obligation. It reflects not just an inherent capacity for movement and action, but also a desire to shed the weight of his age old responsibility. So it's like, I can't move. I just want to get rid of it. That's that movement from ability to desire. And it works thematically with somebody who is in a place where they're worried about what other people think about them. Or currently at this place, it's that he's too thoughtful of others, right? So I would say, go ahead and save those into the story. And if I went back, you see focus and direction, those would be saved. Your Santa now roams freely, driven by the hope of fulfillment just around the corner. 
And then that got me thinking about the problem. So I really like what we got going on here with the focus and direction. Can we circle back to the problem here about thought and maybe put something in there about him concerned what other people think about him? Or maybe he's always so thoughtful of everyone that he almost feels trapped. I think originally it was just, he was always thinking about his past, which was okay to me. It wasn't very exciting. So then I had this idea. And so what it does is it'll look to see if I've already, if it already has something about that particular story point. And here it's saying, I already have something here. Oh, this is what it was before. He's caught in an endless loop of consideration, pondering over every possible angle. That wasn't very interesting to me. I didn't really connect with that. And then I asked, would you like to overwrite it? Mix in the new thoughts in the existing test, text or skipped updating? This to me is so cool because if you were on subtext like two years ago, I had buttons like merge and rewrite and all this really complicated buttons that were in the boxes. And now I don't have to do any more. You can just say what you want. So you can either overwrite everything you had, you can just mix it in there, or you can just skip it if you don't want to mess with it. So I said definitely mix in the new thoughts. And this is the cool part but lean more on them. So heavily weight your storytelling and your illustration of it more towards this new stuff, but keep the good thing in there. Don't lose what's in there, but just fold that in there. And then I've updated the story ton. So then you're, again, you're just mixing in different weights of different thematic elements to put in there. So you get a really rich idea of what your story is about. Santa Claus is enveloped in a perpetual concern about what others think of him. The constant loop of reflection weighs heavily on his mind, contributing to his focus on the freedom. So it's like putting all of that in there so that now I have a really good concrete understanding of what his character is all about. And I said, I think that's all for today. Can you grab all of them, read them back to me, and then paint a picture of who he is? I think it went and grabbed everything. This is me trying to get it to read back. This might have been an area where it wasn't doing what I was asking it to. <laughs> so then let me go back to the conversations. And let's see where. Let's see, it was these ones. Instinct does his thing. Exploring his main character concern. Santa's journey. Main character. Oh, okay. So then. I moved on to the obstacle character. So just real quick, the obstacle character is the one who challenges the main character to grow. So then have we worked on the obstacle character yet? So that's great. So I can just jump into my story because I think this was like three or four days after and I'm doing a lot. So sometimes I can't remember what it is that I did. So I just asked, have we worked on the obstacle character yet? I don't have to go look at it. I don't have to go look and see. I don't have to find it. And it seems we haven't specifically worked on the obstacle character yet, describes what that is. And then would you like to develop it? And then I was testing out the relationship story of three line. And I thought I had this. Yeah. Okay, cool. Have we worked on the, oh, so then this was the more of the relationship story. We haven't worked on that yet. And then I thought, well, let's first try and figure out a couple of different obstacle characters. I was thinking like three different people he runs into. Because I was thinking of that one story where McCandless, right? Isn't that his name? Chris, Christopher, where he goes west and then he eventually ends up in Alaska in a school bus, that guy. There's different obstacle characters he meets on his journey. So I thought, oh, that'd be fun. I'll do that. And that might also be actually what happens in Nomad Land too. And I just come up with a couple of different ideas. The skeptical scientist, who's a geologist who's in Sedona studying rock formations, a new age healer, and then the jaded retiree, which I might have seen these before, but they're okay. So I said, I like number two for sure. Number three isn't too bad either. I just decided I liked all of them. Let's illustrate each a bit more in depth and detail and save them away. So then... Again, it's just taking, it's, I like that idea. I don't like that idea. Let's put them together and then save them in my story form so I can work on them. So Dr. Jessica Stone is a renowned geologist in Sedona for a research project. Raised in an academic family that prides strict logic, Jessica dismisses myths and magic. So you can see where that's going. The new age healer, Nadine Moon, she's a vibrant local healer known for her wisdom and alternative healing techniques. Perfect for Sedona. Her or diverse upbringing, taught her that inner peace leads to healing. And then the jaded retiree, Walter Green, a retired bank manager who moved to Sedona seeking solace after his wife's passing. 
I feel like I've seen that three or four times. Once joyful, he becomes cynical, distant from happiness. All right, it's fine for a... Actually, that's the wet hole on. Is that the same thing? Each character should enrich your story, providing depth in multiple perspectives. All right. Those are all great. Oh, but it doesn't look like they were saved. Again, this is me testing stuff. I've now successfully saved them. Oh, it still didn't do it. I'll try and do it one more time. This is me testing. Okay, so then it finally worked. You won't have to do that. This is me, like, testing all this stuff. Because, again, when I started building this seven years ago, this was not a possibility. So the fact that it works as good as it does is really, I have to change the way I think. And that's the reason why this video is so long, why I'm just, like, talking about everything. Because it's a completely different way of developing a story that's actually available to you, like, right now. So you know, it's got the blue links and some of the visuals don't quite look as beautiful as they probably could. I don't care. I'm just putting that out there. And it might be, you might not be able to delete something. Or you might see some weird, strange story points that are in there because it's something that I created five years ago. I just think this is so cool. I'm not going to wait to make it perfect. So just roll with me and just know that if the last 16 years where everything's had structure and order and it's been like, hey, we got to put this here and do this here, the next 20 or so years are going to be all about chaos. Not that you would get rid of the order, but that now we can balance it out with a little bit more chaos, right? So if you're familiar with the difference between order and chaos, all your ideas have more space to roam here and then be structured. So we can take advantage of all the work that we've done in the last couple of decades to get all the structural pieces in line. But now we're not stuck in that structure. You can flow with it and move over this part and go over here and do this sort of thing. It's so freaking cool. It's really fun. So I'm just having fun. <laughs> I get annoyed because I'm supposed to be building this thing and testing it. But then I start to have fun making the story and putting it together. And then I probably get frustrated too if something doesn't work. I understand where you're coming from, but at least then it forces me to fix it. But I'd rather just write stories in here all day. All right, so it saved those away. And then I, again, I went back to No Man Land. How can we use that to start developing Walter? So I was just going to start with Walter first. So in order to balance out Fern, her obstacle character, I totally don't remember what that is in the story, is psychology. Lots of reasons for it, but it's just this domain of psychology where it highlights how the influence of characters like Swanky, I guess maybe that's a character in the, I don't remember, involves the internal thinking process, how they process their circumstances and inspire others to reflect and grow. So it's like she's running into all these kind of dysfunctional people that influences her and whether or not she's dysfunctional. It's the same thing with Santa is going to go visit all these dysfunctional people. So let's explore how we can apply this to Walter Green. So now it's not just this like typical large language model AI. I've seen this a million times thing, which it is. But now we're going to bring a little bit of narrative structure to it and a little bit more intelligence to it and make it fit somatically with what Santa is going through. So Walter represents a mindset hardened by experiences and loss, a process of narrowing his thoughts that have closed him off from joy. So if Santa has a thing where he feels like his thoughts are almost captured by other people and he always has to be thoughtful, here's this other guy who has progressively over time narrowed his thoughts and narrowed his thoughts to close himself off from everybody. And then it's, oh, okay, but if I, so then Santa would say, okay, if I'm more like him, I'm going to have to constrict myself and I'm gonna, I don't want to be like that. So then he lives in that moment of thought and will Walter will eventually get to a place where he essentially becomes more like Santa, right? So it's because Santa's going to be the one that stays true to himself. He's going to adjust the world around him. So that to me is super exciting. His skepticism leads Santa to rethink how joy is perceived. It's not handed to you. It's created within. As Walter slowly opens up to new possibilities, his evolving mindset also encourages Santa to consider his methods of reaching out to others. You can see how they're connected together. In a shortcut, if you don't know all this stuff, you and I are both alike. That's the conversation between the main character and the obstacle character. So I really like that. And then I worked in the 
obstacle character problem and solution. So that would be what is Walter's problem. And then at the end, what does he grow into? And this part I'm super excited about too, because I've been trying to make this work for over a year now, where it tries to do something that is not a part of the narrative framework that I've created here with subtext. It comes up with its own ideas and its own narrative framework, and then I can make it work behind the scenes. So it said, it seems that I incorrectly tried to access specific methods that don't exist. And it will progressively get to a place where it will get to the right answer. But essentially that his problem was stagnation and then transformation. That's very general. It's not exactly what we're looking for, but it's okay. It's like a storytelling start, but then I want to get that specific narrative structure the same way that I took the general understanding of Walter. And now he's like in this dysfunctional psychological realm. So I said, that's pretty good. No, I was thinking of the obstacle character problem and solution. Can you look those two up? And I could do search. I could go type no man land and look and scroll. To me, this is much easier. In no man land, the op if I was going for a walk, then I could just talk and we could just work out the whole story while I'm off hiking or whatever. In no man land, the obstacle character's problem. So then it found the actual problem and solution that matched the map and sync up with what the narrative of Nomadland is to sync up with Fern and all her stuff. And that is that the awesome characters have a problem of self-awareness. Either they're completely self-absorbed, they only see things through their own eyes, see the world through their own lens, and then eventually get to a place where they have greater awareness of everything around them. So you can see how that's a really nice sort of Christmassy thing, right? Or at least how it could be switched to a Christmassy thing. So then how do we apply that to Walter? Oh, so then it applies it to Walter. So this is great. So I not only get, I'm actually learning about narrative structure for one thing. Now I'm actually getting the answer here. Walter might be overly focused on his own loss and the resulting cynicism. Right. Okay. My life is just the worst. Present, preventing him from engaging positively with others. And then at the end, expanding his focus to be more conscious of the world around him. That sounded actually really great. So I just added. Asked it to save that away. And then I said, let's go ahead and work out an AD. Right? Okay, let's go to the healer. Certainly, let's tailor her arc. It, because it's the same thing, now it's just her version of self-awareness and then her version of awareness. So Nadine might possess a profound self-awareness of her healing abilities and spirituality. So you can see how it's the same thing, the same thematic instance, an overabundance of self-awareness. But whereas Walter's is more inwards, Hers is, oh, I, she's like one of those gurus that just so proud of themselves and is just so full of who they are and can get an idea what that is. And that sometimes leads you to become disconnected from those. So they're both instances of people who have self-awareness issues. One has too much and one has not enough. Like they're completely, don't know how much self-awareness and how they're affecting everybody, right? And then at the end, by becoming more outwardly aware, Nadine can learn to appreciate the various perspectives. So while she's in her meditation guru, like always in this space, then it's less about who she is and more about what other people are going through. Like some people can profess to be a healer and like a guru, and but they're really just all about themselves. And it's really just to further their own ego. This would be the same idea. But it will work nicely with Walter. And in the story, I wouldn't have to say this exactly. This is the subtext, right? We're looking at subtext. That's the name of the application. So it's what's underneath and it's what's driving everything. It's being slowly coded and slowly formed. But I necessarily wouldn't say this out loud. Like I wouldn't say, oh, I have so much self-awareness and so much ego. Anytime you, you put into illustration of what these terms are and what's going on then it becomes very cringy and really obvious with the story it's you're reading to somebody the meaning of it and that's not going to work out it's always there's lots of examples where when characters speak out what the story form is about that it just is it's the worst thing in the world it's like you're getting hit over the head with what the theme is all about and i love that so i had it save it away again Oh, so this was interesting. 
and I'm of two worlds of this, so I, I might do it so you can create an actual different story point. But I like the idea that it's, there's already something in there with Walter. Do you want to overwrite that or mix it in? So again, that could be a place where you could mess around with different obstacle characters and then decide, oh, I hate Walter. I just want to do Nadine. You could do a story where it's just the one obstacle character or completely skip it. So I was worried that I was going to break it, but I said, can you just add it to the end of what we already have for Walter? So I can just say exactly what I would do if I was doing it myself in the boxes. I would just copy paste. That's what these copy paste buttons are for. I would copy hers and just paste it to the end. Not necessarily weave it in, put it at the end of it. So that's both are saved. So it, it, it perfect. Here's Walter's. And here's Nadine's, and then that's saved away in the obstacle character problem. And then I just asked it to do the same thing for awareness, so it did that as well. So both ideas are saved there, and I can always refer to them later. Which really helps out when I'll go through and do the story beats. I'm going to try and take this as far as I possibly can, and I'll show you how I was able to fold those in there. <laughs> yeah, so that I had it visualize Walter for me. And then I decided I want to make it more 2010s. And I probably should have said A24. Maybe this is A24-ish. But I thought this was great. This is cool. This is Walter out here in Arizona. Cranky guy with his hat. So I thought that was really fun. Save that away. And then Nadine, I thought was really funny too. I wouldn't have imagined her this way. I guess I was imagining her being older. And I could always change it. But again, this is, oh, that's actually interesting. Maybe I should... Make her a little bit younger than I had thought, but she has all her crystals and all that stuff. Maybe that'll spur on something that I will use with Santa. Maybe he'll make her a, a crystal or find one specifically for her. Oh, and I really like the style. And I said, can you do one now for Santa? So here he is. <laughs> he looks like, uh, what's his name from Big Lebowski? It looks like that's who he'd be played by with his Santa socks and his Christmas tree. And yeah, I think that's pretty cool. It's like a red coach, like his sleigh, but it's a van. So to me, that was really fun to save away. And I'm going to set it up so then you can just save these into the different overviews, like the different through lines. So you can always have that visual in the same way that the conversations are attached to different story points. You can attach all the images to that. So that gives you a pretty good idea of um, what it takes or what it, I'm sorry. That gives you a pretty good idea of the new muse and how you can slowly but surely meld everything together and kind of form. You're really sculpting your story just through conversation and really take advantage of the decades of information that's stored in here and that it's been trained on. I'm constantly looking at the results of when it tries to build a story form. I'll do other videos, but then now you can start to build the story form, add it to the story. And then we're always tuning that up to make it really effortless and a little bit more intuitive when it comes to getting the one unique story form. This one's easy because I'm essentially just grabbing the Nomad Land one. I'm going to change a key part of it, but I want to show that in a separate video. I just wanted to show everybody, welcome them to the new era of subtext news and story development. And it just opens up so many possibilities when you don't have to fish through, search, teach yourself every single bit of theory, know where to look for things. Where is everything stored in subtext? I need to know where it's all saved. It's still all there. I haven't taken any of it out and I don't plan on taking any of it out. I just would highly encourage doing this because it's way more fun. It seems closer to the creative process and I think it is much more productive experience all around. So that'll do it for my first introduction to the brand subtext with Muse. If you have any kind of questions, please leave them down below and then I will answer them or head over to the Discord and I can answer that there. You can email me directly, all that good stuff. I'm just going to be doing a lot more of these workflow videos kind of showing how it works, less teaching theory and more how you can just instantly jump in and use everything that's been set up but maybe not spend so much time learning about it more time spent getting things done getting your work finished cool all right so i hope everybody's doing great thanks for watching and i will see you next time